film works. So I'd like to show you that. Sometimes say it's not about what you know, but who you know. Meet the Adventure Center. You can find us on the sixth floor of the city's technology park. In the park, the little arms create a core. Our hotspot for up and coming entrepreneurs can come here to get the connections they need to grow their companies. And the best innovation happens here fast. The Adventure Center was really established to really be a gateway in Central Arkansas. Wandering around downtown, West Little Rock, wherever, there's office space everywhere. Uh, 
we could have done that and just let people come here and bang away on the keyboard all day and that'd be all they would get out of the space. And, but that's not what we ever intended. So the Vision Center obviously plays an important role with events that they put on like this and some of the other community building efforts, the networking efforts, and then you'll see some of the, the tenants that we've uh, been able to inherit that spun out of some of the accelerator work they do. Uh, so uh, very valued partnership uh, beyond just being a tenant. Uh, and just us being their label, uh, so I uh, appreciate that. But uh, this is the same presentation I gave to the bank group uh, about, uh, I don't know, about four or five, six weeks ago, something like that. But it's a good uh, short summary of where we've been and where we're going, and then at the end I'll be glad to answer any questions about the project and, and uh, anything else you'd like to ask. It's rendering phase two, if you haven't seen it. but. Uh, this is a, a very applicable quote as to what we, we created here when we set up phase one uh, and then with the intent of the other phases that I'll talk about more in a minute. But uh, this, this shows you that you gotta have more than uh, the people and then the ideas, you have to actually have an environment to put them in and that's what, that's what the tech park is. For the, for the history piece, uh, you know, we are in 2019, we stood this building up in 2017, but you can look how long, far back it was to get this even off the ground. The actual concept even started earlier than this, 2005. Uh, Jay Cheshire, that's with the chamber, uh, originally brought the idea from Hot Springs. Uh, there wasn't much reception for it in Hot Springs, but when he got here and took over the, the chamber here in Little Rock, uh, there was definite need coming along for, the original intent of the project was more research, uh, biomed and nano uh, technology, because those are the expertise of UMS and UNLR. So the original intent of the project was to be very science and research heavy, uh, old school science and research park, which you see bolted on universities all across the country. Uh, thank goodness it took as long as it did to get the project off the ground, because if we were uh, on one of those campuses, we'd be trying to figure out how to get down that's what everybody's done around the country, including all other research institutions. You see some old school, still some old school science and research parks on university campuses, but most of them have kind of tried to spin it out and put it in an environment similar to what we've done here. The legislation that they created set us up, we're a, we're a public entity, uh, not public as we trade on any kind of stock market, public as in uh, all of our, our board meetings are open to the public, subject to Freedom of Information Act. Uh, we are a standalone public entity, not part of the city, not part of the state. Uh, similar to the, the Little Rock Port Authority. Uh, it's been around forever. Uh, we kind of run in our own little silo, but we do have that responsibility because uh, the major funding for this project is, is when sales tax receipts are uh, So that's uh, kind of who owns this. Nobody owns it. It's, a, it's its own entity. The money that the, the project makes goes right back into the project. And I can explain some more about that if someone's interested. But uh, you see, in 2011, we actually set up the authority and formed the entity. I didn't come to work here until 2014. Uh, so it, they spent three years kind of researching around the country about what to do uh, with this project and, and how to do it. Uh, visit several cities around the country that were doing similar things to a degree. Uh, the first board meeting I attended, which is like my third day of work, was the day <coughs> that the commercial real estate consultant recommended these blocks of property that we own uh, to be purchased. So the timing of when I came on board and when all this was kind of getting a little bit of momentum was, was running a, a really tight race. Uh, I don't know if you remember, some of you probably do because you came, but we had space down in Markham across the state house. Uh, that was our first uh, efforts into uh, introducing ourselves to the tech community in Little Rock. And I, I think that was a blessing because it allowed us to create some relationships and get to know some people and start with a small tenant base that moved up here with us versus trying to start from scratch when we opened the doors of this place. Uh, so that was a that was a big key. Uh, and the Venture Center was with us down there too. And, 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 and definitely created a lot of those interactions uh, to allow the tech part. Because I was working, almost everything I was doing was related to, to getting this stood up. Uh, so they handled, they did a great job of handling the, 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 the events that kind of created buzz around the project at the time. Yeah, 2016, we bought these properties, spent about 11 months on it, and opened the doors in March 2017. Uh, you, 
can see we brought 12 tenants with us when we moved up here, uh, and obviously grown quite a bit since. Uh, we've got, I think the current count is 52 companies that are in here now. Uh, we've been at that 90% or above occupancy rate since, not counting the, the desks that we rent. Uh, we don't want to count those in the office occupancy, but the, the office wise, we've been above 90% for about 14 months. Uh, so, uh, really doing well with that. Yeah, it's, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and we've had lots of churn too. Uh, companies get in here and, and don't stick. We've had companies get too big, move out. Uh, we've had some. Uh, shape the, themselves in different ways within the building too, shrinking and growing. So, but that, the ability to fill the building up and the ability to, uh, we have a building we own on the other side of this wall that we lease to the state. Uh, so the rent revenue from that, plus the sales tax disbursements we get allow us to retire some big chunks of debt that we took out to buy all this property and then renovate these two buildings. So that's where that five point eight million dollar some of the success stories, uh, Apogee, everybody's heard of that one because that's, that's one of the bigger, uh, bigger stories of Little Rock's tech scene. Uh, they, Justin, started when we were down there on Markham, it was just him for a while, and then he quickly got too big for, for that space down there. He was pre-phase one of the tech park. Uh, and of course, he's, he's done tons of great things. Bond was a, a company that came out of the accelerator uh, that's growing uh, in little chunks, but making a lot of progress here recently. Uh, MobX just moved out. Uh, they're going to be their work with ESPN is going to put them in a in a situation where they, they wouldn't fit in here. Uh, so they just moved out while they, they finish up some of that stuff. And then Lumo Exchange is another accelerator uh, company that moved here from uh, Atlanta and is, is doing some some good things in, in their in their market. I think SBS was another accelerator, and they're not in here. Uh, main biggest reason they were too big. Uh, when they moved, decided to move from Birmingham to here, uh, we didn't have the space for them. They ended up in North Little Rock, but they came through the accelerator program and spent a lot of time on this floor and getting introduced to, to Little Rock and decided to make it their home. And then Hue is a, is a uh, creative digital firm that's uh, kind, of, kind of a revolving door of the team members that are in here uh, that work in here in different chunks of time, but they, they've got some big time clients and doing some big time work across the country. Some of these numbers, people are always interested uh, in some of the diversity uh, with us being a, a southern city, uh, comparing us to some other markets. Uh, and you can see some of the numbers that we have within the, the space. Uh, but that last number, that 7% black or Hispanic tenants, that is a larger number than they have in, in Silicon Valley. So uh, we're pretty, pretty proud of that number that we've been able to uh, cross some paths and, and get some people in the building to where it's, it's got that diversity uh, mix that uh, people that are interested in what we're doing uh, appreciate, uh, that, that it's appealing to all, all, all folks there in town that we have. Partnership, I already spoke about the partnership with the Bench Center. That's a, that's a key component for us, for sure, which we've mentioned of our, uh, for the reason I've already mentioned. Uh, now, I uh, think a little bit about where we're going and what we're doing. Well, what you're standing in is phase one, obviously, uh, and this is this is actually facing the way it should. So that five is that parking lot across the street, which we own. Uh, and two is going to be a building I'll talk about in a minute. We have a parking lot between here and Channel Seven. Uh, and then three is a what we'll do with the building next door when the state moves out. Uh, we're not sure. They've got another about two and a half years on their lease. Uh, the Department of Education, the Department of Higher Ed. We'll decide at the end of those, at the, closer to the end of that term, do we need that building? Are we ready to explain, expand into that? Do we go in there and renovate it? Because as nice as it is, it doesn't fit this, this scene. It's more 1980s um, investment firm looking in office space. <laughs> Very dark wood. Uh, everybody's got their own little office, so that kind of deal. And then four, that's on the back side, on the east side of the building. Uh, what we do, Regarding uh, possibly debt, uh, parking lots. Mm -hmm. We're going to put buildings on all these lots. We got to have something to do with the cars. Uh, but that's kind of a slow play for us. <laughs> Previously, that was phase three. We moved it to four because we don't know where automobiles and mass transit and all those things for Little Rock, where those are going to be. And so you don't want to go build a huge deck and then nobody drives cars anymore. Uh, and so that's a 
that's what we got to be very careful with. And then, of course, we don't know what's going to happen with Channel 7. Uh, you know, they're moving. But uh, the ownership of uh, that station, we're really proud of that building and that parking deck. Uh, <laughs> to the point where uh, it's, not in, it's not in our budget, and a lot of these budgets won't be in. Uh, so that was in our original phasing plan, but it's not now. Not even considering that. So uh, we'll see what happens. That things change as they, as they move. That building sits empty. They're, they may change their mind. I want to leave that thing for them. But that would change. That would change what we would do on that back side. Because if we owned, uh, you know, the front part is part of the, on the National Historic Register. The, the annex part and the deck are not. So you could knock that thing down uh, and, and not create as much controversy. When you start messing with the the Worthing Building, which is what that is. That's way down the road for us. Phase two, that's where uh, all the uh, majority of my focus, besides uh, keeping this place running, uh, that's where I am now. And, and I'm excited to say in the last month we made some big, big progress uh, regarding that phase. I can't talk about it uh, because we're not there yet, but uh, for those that are interested, it's getting closer to something happening there. Uh, we've, we've got some very interested, significant kind of anchor tenant, uh, tenants uh, that are uh, interested in the project. And we have the ability with this project, uh, we do, besides being a public entity, but despite being a public entity, we have the ability to take on partnerships. So we could have some private uh, partnerships or some ownership, we could share ownership in that building too, or we could kind of minimize uh, the building. So if someone wanted to come in and buy it, or so they can actually own that within the space and, and within the project. So uh, lots of possibilities there, and that's kind of some of the things we're working through that's that's making things a little more realistic than I would have said six months ago. So pretty exciting there. We, we already have designed the building. Uh, we have already budgeted the building, so we don't have much it costs. Uh, what we'll do is we'll come in and finish out the first floor, <coughs> which will include uh, a large restaurant bigger than the coffee shop, uh, and then uh, a large meeting space. That's the flaw of this first phase. We don't have a big uh, meeting space. So uh, we are gonna do that in this building, and then the tech park, uh, once we add that building, we'll have to add staff, so there'll be, the, the tech park offices will be on that floor, and then everything behind the scenes will be on the back side of it. Uh, and then we'll do everything from there up shelf space to where a tenant will come in and design the floor how they want it to, or a quarter of the floor, or Two thirds of the floor, do a lot of different things. So that'll be different than this building where you pretty much get what we give you. Uh, and this is all turnkey, most of the space in here is line to line. That over there will be long term leases, five, probably more tenure type leases, uh, a tenant taking either a full floor or multiple floors. Uh, so we'll have a mix of the, the all the way from the startup to a very established, uh, productive company uh, with, with big revenue numbers that provides us some diversity in uh, our revenue stream, uh, which is big uh, going forward. But the five stories, uh, 85,000 square feet, did you know that there was uh, a difference, there's a there's actual a measurement that determines whether you have a skyscraper or not? Yeah. Anybody in here an insurance person? <laughs> there it actually is. So that's why that building is only five stories. The fifth story will be really tall uh, because you, you're measured by the bottom floor the bottom of your top floor, if you go over, I can't remember what the number is, but if you go over a certain level, it, it, that becomes a skyscraper. So your construction costs are more, insurance is more, uh, all these other things. So we we have designed this building where the bottom of the fifth floor is just below skyscraper level, but we'll do a really fancy top floor. Uh, I didn't know that going into this, but pretty interesting. But uh, what's gonna be cool about this building, uh, the way we have it designed now, you can see these across the front. Of course, that is facing west, and so the afternoon sun. So the way the architect has designed this is they'll actually be like louvers that will automatically move as the sun moves. These louvers will move and keep this in the shade. Plus, they're going to do some treatment to this glass where uh, the sun won't, won't be an impact at all. But uh, pretty, pretty advanced stuff. You know, the, the reason this is so big, it's big for us because of where we need the project to go and where we need Little Rock to go. 
but it's uh, it's gonna be big new construction on Main Street doesn't happen very often. I don't know if y'all walk up and down, it's a bunch of old buildings, uh, and, and a bunch of old buildings have gone away ever since that parking lot used to be at the center theater. Uh, some older, older folks in here will remember that there was a movie theater there uh, that uh, was knocked down mid 2000s sometime. Uh, some people were sad to see it go. That whole block across the street, that parking lot, that was all buildings. You can go in my office downstairs and you can see what, it, what this whole block used to look like uh, in the 1920s. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Main Street, you know, Main Street Capitol, which is the Capitol right here, just that was the main intersection in Little Rock at the time. Uh, and, and lots changed uh, over the course of the years, of course. Uh, but we're uh, really looking forward to doing something new uh, and something very uh, trend setting, and, and, but still mixing in with the rest of downtown. Why phase two? Of course, we need the additional space. And, and our intent is the companies get too big to be in here and they either move out somewhere, which is what some of them have done, or they grow and move into there. Uh, and we'll see how that shakes out. We could, uh, we may not have the space available when we move in. That would take us in up high here on phase three. Remember, I mentioned the science and research lab part of it. Uh, that, was a big initiative when the project first started and it's tail off considerably because of the amount of grant money out there for these it's really shrunk. Uh, especially under the current presidency. Uh, you know, you get another president in, whatever that is, that could all change. But right now it's really shrunk, so there's not a lot of stuff spinning out of UMS and UNR. Uh, the Arkansas Terms Hospital also has a lot of research component. Uh, well, we're gonna build this building where it has the ability to we can convert space into wet and dry lab if something comes commercializes and out of there, instead of having to tear walls apart, put all the fancy duct work and everything else that a lab requires, it's all going to be built into that building. They're going to be stacked in one corner all the way up. So if somebody does come to us, uh, something spins out of UALR and it's ready, uh, ready to go commercial and, and get off of a campus and be a, a research project to a real business, we'll be able to accommodate that uh, because there's not a lot of that space in the world, very, very little actually. And then, uh, of course, the Commerce capabilities I mentioned, and then, of course, the advancement of Little Rock. This project was never intended to just be this. So we've got uh, we've got to keep the project moving forward and keep the momentum going that this is built into that uh, that next phase. This is important to some people, others just not. And if you're not familiar with the way this current phase was was uh, financed, Citizen Little Rock passed sales tax in 2011. Cent sales tax. This was the economic development component of it. They designated $22 million to this project. We're not going to end up getting $22 million. If you keep up with it, the sales tax receipts lag a little bit. We'll probably forecast to get around 20. So we went out and bought all these properties to do all this, uh, which was important because we didn't want to buy just these, these properties and then somebody else decide, well, I want to be close to Tech Park, so I'm going to buy that one that can run in the middle of the lot. So we wanted to control all of this. We wanted to control our own parking. Uh, so we went out and borrowed uh, money to do all that because the chunks of money from the city only come annually. They didn't give us all this at one time. So spread out over that time period, 10 year time period of the sales tax, we're knocking out the debt uh, with that money plus the revenue from this building next school uh, while the revenue from this building pays for the operating expenses here. But for this next phase, we don't have that sales tax receipts to rely on. So uh, we're looking at anything in, under the sun uh, to do this. It may be somebody that wants to give us a bunch of money and wants a name on the bill. Uh, it could be the anchor tenant uh, prospects that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, all kinds of grants and other things to go out there and pursue that are hard to get, but, but you can pursue them. And then we may go back to the banks again. We don't want to. We'd rather start uh, zero debt on that building. Because by the time the, sun, the sales tax sunsets, 2022, by our current plans, we will have all the debt paid off, which is 24 million. We actually, uh, I mean, sorry, 26 million, which is the same about the same amount as that building next door. Uh, the cost struck because of that 26 million dollars worth of debt. So uh, we, we'd rather do that zero debt, and if we're able to attract a couple of anchor tenants, we'll be able to be able to do that, uh, and especially if they come in as a partner. In so we'll see how that progresses over the next couple months. But that's it. That's it. I didn't show you a lot of renderings of it. Um, 
but uh, you can kind of see, can you, can you see that okay? Well, I can kind of explain what we're doing. I talked about the louvers part, but this is all one building. The, the architect has designed it where this, this, uh, this will look like the rest of downtown. This will look modern and this will look like the rest of downtown, so it really blends in really well. But you can see the restaurant, obviously, that'll all be the, the conferencing center, uh, conference center on that side. Uh, and then there is no rendering to the upper floors because shell space let somebody come in and tell us what they want uh, and, and build that out accordingly but that's channel seven you can see right there so a big street side cafe it's going to have kind of an elevator those are stairs you can't really see them that well uh, in this because uh, if you notice main street slopes that way and we wanted to go even across and so this you know our sign in the front goes and zigzags says our technology park will actually move that and this but this will continue across all the buildings that this kind of awning piece so it'll be pretty slow. And then we're also kind of playing the waiting game with what the city will do with our streetscape. We've done down there, up there, or down there, up there. Uh, they've done a bunch of stuff with all the catching the rainwater and tr different trees and everything else. But they've left this block alone, which is good because we're gonna come in with cranes and, and do all this other stuff that would, that would jeopardize all that. But we're curious what they will do after we're finished with construction make it blend in with the rest of the main streets. So, yeah, look at the field. But, uh, yeah, WER is architect, uh, and then CDI contractors, local or companies, or, or who uh, have, have uh, <coughs> been hired to do that, that main space, and we, we get going. Once we start, they tell us once they got the first shovel hits the dirt over there, it's about 18 months of construction. So if we started tomorrow, we're still a little late that. premises of condo, uh, you know, I own the building, but you bought your yeah. condo. We would we would own the building, but you would buy your floor, right? right. Two floors right. or four floors or whatever. There's enough there's enough living around here. Uh, and and I think that's an attraction. Uh, <coughs> so that's a big piece of wheel, but we don't want to be in that business. Okay. That won't be that kind of floor. So you mentioned uh, the conference space and my ears were cut so do you know about like what your plan is as far as how much space you'll have like if for instance you decided you wanted to have the rock that kind of there right if you open is it going to be able to host like hundreds of people or is it more of like conference space for you guys to have larger meetings and like no it's it'll be i want to say they have designed where it would hold like 400 but it'll be able to be divided into two it'll have a Wallet they've already gone and priced it. A wall system that will build five since you get two smaller conferences or, or one conference using different parts uh, and divided up that way. So uh, there'll be some flexibility, but it'll be significantly bigger than one like downstairs. Uh, and, and hopefully we can host things like that. That's, it. That's the hope. It's common. So in the in the uh, as you talk about the economic development part of the sales tax, uh, and you probably end up with twenty million. So we're backloaded. We only get like a million and a half a year, but now we're getting closer to, this, to the end. Now we should start getting bigger chunks of money, and then I'll, then I'll immediately go to pay out know, that debt. But it's money that goes to developing this facility. It's not going to be paid back, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, that that money, yes, that money was set aside, but we loaded on it. Yeah. It all goes directly to this project. It can only be used for capital expenses. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, I didn't hear that. How long do you say the construction time would be? 18 months, which and 24 months. I mean, <laughs> being realistic. Uh, that's what they told us. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a projection of when you think that would start? Like, is this in the next 12 months, or would it be longer? Uh, it could be longer, but I hope it's less in the next six months. Yes, I mean, I hope the, where we are with a couple of these these prospects, uh, you know, if we can lock one of them, the, the main one up, and if we're <coughs> right, we can say, okay, but we don't have to. We don't have to start. We don't have to have 100 percent occupancy to start that project. Sure. We need 100 percent of money. Preferably. Things change, but uh, that's the goal. Did, uh, is any of that change this building? So is there any like in the coffee shop that move or is, is they say they want the first shot at that uh, that restaurant. And so they could change the dynamic of the first floor of this building. Right. We could totally repurpose that. I mean every, everything else is self-contained, so like second floor, third floor. Um, you will we will <coughs> open up a hole. You know, you'll be able to go into that building because uh, it'll, it'll be a portal just like you go from this building into the three store. Yeah. It'll be one you pass through and go into that so building. So that's steps it. Steps and everything to align the floor. Right. No, well, I, I can't remember how they line the floors up. Obviously, these, this building, the floors don't line up. They don't line up in there. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> is the elevator less confusing? <laughs> <laughs> well, we take that one. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I talk to the, you know, the, the, the service guys and techs, HBC guys, and I try to explain to them this 126R, and they like glaze over, <laughs> end up over there, wandering around. If it doesn't have an R by it, it's full of grumpy people, don't go in. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. This is true. Would there be, I mean, you said something about five year leases. Are you, is that the minimum you think on these new spaces? Will you do one year or? No, I don't think Just five years at the minimum? Yeah. I think that would be, be on the shorter end. Like for us to dedicate, Two floors, because we've had this discussion with a, a prospect. For us to build a it, we had a 10-year lease. For us to allow you to take up that much space, if we're, if we're going there and do the tenant pitch out, well, that's how we get our money back uh, on that. So uh, if we could extend that over that amount of time. But we'll see. I mean, we, it could get to a point where, okay, maybe we don't, maybe nobody wants the second floor. We're busting the seam still in here. We could, if we could take the second floor there and make it more of a month to month space. Mm -hmm. We, we do all kinds of things. And we want to be that flexible and nimble because this industry is flexible and nimble. So, all right. I'll keep my, I'm running over time. I'm one minute and 26 seconds by the clock. So, uh, I better let the lawyers talk. But uh, thanks uh, and I uh, appreciate uh, everybody coming out. And have a great week. Brandon routinely offices at the Tech Park, 
where he works closely with clients who have participated in various Arkansas Accelerator programs. A magna cum laude graduate of UALR's uh, William H. Bowen School of Law, Brandon has also received his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Arkansas and worked for a Fortune 500 company at a crude oil refinery prior to joining Wright Lindsay Jennings. That was a mouthful. I'm Deb here. Please welcome Adrian and Brandon.
as a leader of tech law, often feel like an entrepreneur myself. Um, even though I have the great support of partners and the firm like Adrian, it's still a learning experience um, how to deal, build a practice in this space, um, especially as a young attorney. So these are some things that I feel like are universal for everyone and something that I, I've really learned over the last year and a half working with tech law. So the first tool, and these are all really cheesy, um, but I think the most important tool obviously is you. Um, your business success is really dependent on um, you as the leader in your business, whether you are the founder, whether you're you know, a CEO, or if you're just, um, you know, you're an hourly employee, but you are really passionate about taking your company to the next level and really have the leadership skills to do it. Um, some of the things I think that, and, and tips that I feel like are important in this is you as a tool, it's, it's important to be authentic to yourself and your values um, and perhaps your history, but also be flexible. Um, I've experienced that a lot with tech law, um, as Adrian mentioned, been around for 119 years. We really built our reputation on being good old fashioned trial lawyers, um, I've been to court once and it was the most terrifying experience of my life. Um, so I am very happy to go, be flexible and go the, a, 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 a different direction. Um, and I think having the firm have that flexibility as well has really been important to, um, to kind of this new entrepreneurial path with tech. And from my perspective, um, as a business owner myself and um, the operator of said business, um, the you component is definitely the most important. And my, my message to you and my message to my clients who are entrepreneurs, business owners, and operators is to take care of yourself. When you're trying to get a business off the ground or trying to run a business, a lot of times self-care and work-life balance seem like they are just not part of your equation. I understand that. We can't have it all all at the same time and keep our, our sanity. But um, it's important to find things to do to give yourself a mental break. You can meditate for five minutes a day, and it makes a huge difference. You can have meetings with your staff when you're walking around the office. You can keep healthy snacks at the office to make sure that you always have the good fuel for your body that you need. Um, doing just some little things like that can help you take a step back from what you're focused on and refresh refresh your mind, refresh your body, and if you do that, you'll come back to whatever your task is with a more focused and innovative mentality. Yeah, I want to say, you got this, and we are rooting for you, so. Um, the second, I think, big tool to keep in mind is your network. So, um, you know, especially as a new business entrepreneurship, it's really important to make connections with potential clients, customers, um, mentors, um, for, for this one, I'm giving a big shout out to the Venture Center. Um, you saw in their, their video, their, they have really three main focuses. I think one of the ones they do the best is the, the, the collaborate focus, um, you know, events like this, um, things they do around the tech park and around the community. Go to those events, meet people. Um, I think it's, it's been really important for me with the tech law space. Um, to meet potential clients, but also meet people that can just educate me more on certain technologies, um, what it's like to be in the tech space, all that kind of stuff. So I would just say, you know, your network is a really big tool. Um, take advantage of opportunities like this, which all of you obviously have today, um, and, and really continue to build that network. One of the things that's been really helpful to me as um, a business owner uh, has been finding mentors who are outside of my field of practice. I have a lot of great mentors inside the firm, uh, but mentors in totally separate lines of business have been an invaluable resource to me. And the way that I have personally found um, those mentors for myself is through serving on nonprofits. You heard in my bio that I'm on the board of directors of the Red Cross in Central Arkansas. I've done that for about eight years. And other members of the board are um, executive level people from a wide variety of businesses from across the state, uh, having a shared passion for that community service uh, function 
has enabled us to build relationships and trust with one another. And I know I can call any one of them with a business related question and they will pick up the phone and take my call and give me advice. And um, to me, it's been very, very helpful to have mentors that are outside of my field of practice. So I would encourage you to try to purposefully include them in your network. Third thing, I said you were most important, this might be the most important, your team, so really, um, you know, a business is only gonna go as far as your employees take it. Um, for me, it's been great to have a whole group of attorneys that work on tech law from different practice areas. I get questions from people all the time about employment law. I typically do IP stuff, so um, it's great to have attorneys or even <coughs> staff members, and secretaries, paralegals, who can really help pick up the slack when you, you know, you aren't as knowledgeable in a subject area as they might be. From a legal perspective, your team is also one of your biggest areas of potential risk. Um, you know, employees, if you have one bad apple, as you probably know, it can lead to a lot of problems. Theft, uh, I, I deal with that in employee embezzlement cases regularly, unfortunately. Not within our company so far, thank God. Um, just, you know, incompetence, bad attitudes, they can damage your client relationships, they can damage your vendor relationships, um, and as, as you may know, in my experience as a business person and a lawyer, your worst employees are the ones who are the most likely to assert an EEOC claim against you or file a lawsuit against you if they feel that they haven't been treated the way they ought to be. So it's very important to build a good team that you trust and make sure that you don't have that person who makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up because if you have a bad feeling about them, I can almost guarantee you it's gonna go down a bad path. Um, so, what we recommend to people is how to attract and retain the best team is to make your workplace a really great place to work. And I'll let Brandon give us our um, self-congratulatory plug there. Well, first I'll say I really hope Adrian pays attention to the Oprah meme. I would love so many days off, so <laughs> that's right, Adrian. Um, the plug is Adrian and the rest of the partners at our firm have actually been doing a really great job. I couldn't go without saying that um, in 2018, we're listed as one of the best places to work in Arkansas. So uh, that's a pat on the back for Adrian and the rest of our partners and staff. Um, but yeah, pay off. And for 2019 as well. And it's really helped us build a good team. And interestingly, since we were named as the best place to work in 2018, we have had a big influx of resumes from people with all different types of positions who want to join our team. And these are people who work for a variety of types of businesses and we might not have known about them or we not, might not have, we don't really go into other firms and try to take people's good, you know, staff away from them. Um, but getting this recognition has caused us to get a lot of resumes from really good team members, some of whom we've brought onto our team. Um, so if you have the opportunity to take advantage of any kind of a PR opportunity like that, I would highly recommend it. It's been very beneficial for our business. Um, the next big tool, so <clears throat> your business is only going to go as far as, as your assets allow you to go. So, you know, separating yourself from others by building a, a great reputation um, and protecting that reputation from infringement by others. Um, your products and services, this is why you're in, in the business industry in the first place. You're offering something to customers, to clients. <laughs> Um, protecting those in, in every way possible. Um, and other things like your content. I mean, we're in a world right now, a digital world where um, content is keen, really. Um, protecting that from, um, from infringement by others can really help take your business take off. And I will say, on this so completely neutral, totally unbiased opinion, one of the best tools you can ever have is an attorney. Um, and really just kind of prof professional helpers um, all together. But really, at, from an attorney's perspective as an attorney, our job is to protect all the other tools in your toolbox. Um, and so I think that makes um, people like your attorneys, accountants, um, really important for your business because they help make sure that these other great things you're doing, um, you're doing them in the right way, in a way that's gonna benefit your business rather than, rather than hurt. From a 
business person's perspective, it, it's almost hard to grasp the magnitude of how legal implications are gonna affect your business. Every decision you make has a legal implication to it and it's gonna have some kind of consequences. Um, by way of example, you may or may not know whether your business is of a sufficient size that you're subject to the Family Medical Leave Act. You may not know if your employees, if they come to work one day and they hand you an FMLA note from their doctor, you may not know whether you actually have to comply with that doctor's recommendation for an accommodation or not. You may not have to comply. And if you do comply, it might be really expensive. Um, just questions like that that come up all the time. If you have a trusted advisor who can help walk you through those things, it can save you a lot of heartache and money in the long term. Um, and financial advisors too, one issue I've had with some of my business clients regularly is that they wanna manage their own books and they don't wanna pay to have an outside bookkeeper or accountant do it and they maybe don't realize they were supposed to withhold taxes from their employees or they did withhold taxes but they didn't turn them over. They spent them on something else or who knows what happened to them and then they realize, oh, the government put a lien on my house. I didn't realize they could do that. By the time they come to me, sometimes it's too late for us to do very much about it. Um, so I always recommend that entrepreneurs have a trusted, uh, capable accountant to help them with bookkeeping, at least to give advice. Uh, they are invaluable to securing your business and your money. I don't know if you can actually read in the back these <laughs> words. Brandon, I'm gonna let you do it. Maybe you can spit your spin on it, but no way. So basically this is, I've, and this is from experience with new companies and uh, startups that to save money, go to LegalZoom and, and get a, a document, um, which is terrifying. Um, so basically, it's you can go online and sure you can get a document that might work, or you can talk to an attorney that can understand the specific situation that you're in um, and modify agreements to fit that situation. Um, I won't read the means, but I was really proud of this. <laughs> Great, and now I will, we can explain in a little bit more detail for all of you that are just waiting for the legal jargon and the rules and regulations. Here they are. Um, so the, we talked about the attorney being a great tool for you in your business. Um, here are the ways that we can help protect those other aspects of your business. So, um, you know, one of the best ways to protect you is to protect, to protect your business is to protect you personally as well. Um, and that really starts at the beginning of the business process um, with forming, forming a company to begin with. Um, I know Adrian does a lot of commercial litigation. Um, you know, it's important to have these kind of structures in place that protect you personally. Um, so that when the company does get sued, um, they can't come after your, 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 your house, your car, your um, things like that. Um, so having an LLC or a corporation to protect you from those, the things that happen with your business um, is a great way to protect yourself. And the second is to protect your team. Um, and this is really through labor and employment law, which um, is one of, I feel like, our fastest growing practice areas at our firm, um, partially because our labor and employment attorneys do a really good job of educating their clients and potential clients on issues, but also just because it's a, I mean, it's a very, um, I guess, common issue that happens. Every business has employees. A lot have employees that um, get upset about something, and as Adrian mentioned, um, sometimes those employees um, decide that they've had enough and they want to either bring a charge to the EOC or bring a lawsuit. Um, and I think having those protections up front can always minimize that risk. I agree. Uh, something that I've been talking with a lot of my clients about recently is a, a trend that we've seen in Arkansas, and that's some wage and hour lawsuits. And if you don't know what that means, that's okay. I barely know what it means myself. But it's when people claim that they're not being paid um, for all the time that they've worked or that their salary is when they should be hourly and therefore they're not getting overtime. 
and I would say easily daily in Arkansas there is one of these wage and hour lawsuits filed, sometimes more than one a day. Um, there was one uh, filed just last week where a group of tellers banded together and filed a class action against a bank, alleging that the bank should have paid the tellers from the time they walked in the door, had to boot up their computer and wait for it to turn on so they could log in and then clock in for the day. And they claimed that that, that time, that lag time that it took for their computer to boot up and for them to clock in was compensable time, and that because they weren't compensated for that, there was unpaid overtime that they should have received. We don't know what's gonna happen with that case. It was just filed. Um, but those kinds of things happen all the time. I'm not an employment lawyer. That would never cross my mind as a business owner, but that's why on my team, I have an HR director and an HR assistant who know all the things uh, so that I hope we don't get sued for people waiting for their computers to boot up. <laughs> and I was, I had mentioned the rules and regulations. I feel like a lot of times business owners feel like some things are intuitive. Entering a contract, everyone generally knows how to do that, even if you know maybe you don't have all the terms that protect you the best. Um, starting a business, perhaps you can go onto LegalZoom and really get an idea of how to do that. I feel like labor and employment um, is one of the areas that there are so many regulations, so many laws. Um, that I, like Adrian mentioned, if you're not in that world every day, you would not even know. Um, that it could be a potential issue. So, um, when in doubt, call them one law. Um, your network. So, we mentioned earlier that some of the best things for a business, your mentors, maybe advisors, um, clients, customers, vendors, um, the best way to protect those relationships is through contracts and agreements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, LegalZoom, sure you can go on there, you can get a great contract that would probably be valid. Um, you could sit down and write an agreement on a napkin and it would probably be valid um, to get into a contract. Um, and that's great, but contracts really are important when something goes wrong in a relationship. Um, it's not hard to agree that two people will do something. What is hard is when someone doesn't do something how do we know who, who is in the wrong? How, how do we get compensated for that? Those sorts of things that um, LegalZoom or, or a, you know, napkin contract wouldn't cover. Um, and this is something that I'm sure Adrian um, works with every day doing commercial litigation, and a lot of it is contract based. I do, I litigate a lot of contracts that look like they're perfectly well written and then one party thinks it means X and the other party thinks it means Y and nobody knows who's supposed to do what and they end up in court. And it's great for my business because that's how I pay for my kid to go to school, but I don't, you know, it may be a contract not worth that much money and you don't want to have to come out of pocket and take, pay a lawyer $10,000 to try to get a judge to tell you the contract says what you always thought it said. Um, so one of the services that I provide to my clients is I'll review contracts with them, major contracts on the front end. They'll send me one and say, just read through it. I understand their business. I kind of know their risk tolerance tolerances. Just tell me what you think. And I'll say, well, you know, this one looks pretty innocuous for the most part, but it's got this indemnity that's just ridiculous. It says if they do something wrong and someone gets hurt, you have to pay for it. Did you realize your contract said that? No, I didn't. Okay probably need to scratch that out. And you know, advice like, hey, this is one I'd probably ask that they change it, but if they don't, it's up to you. You know, my job as the advisor <coughs> is to make sure that you have all the information you need to decide if this contract fits within your risk tolerance and your business goals. So then my favorite slide, because this is what I do every single day, um, Lawyers are really important for protecting those business assets. So those the products and services you're selling, the content you have. Um, I feel like a lot of new businesses, startups, strap for cash. Um, there's a lot of other things that kind of come on the priority list. Um, marketing to get your product out there, getting a business formed. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, we can just deal with the IP stuff later. Um, I think the, the best approach for small businesses and startups is to at least have a discussion about it at the beginning. 
sometimes a patent might not be the most appropriate strategy for your business, for your product. Um, but having that conversation up front is beneficial because if it is and you wait too long, then you're not going to be able to get a patent at all. Um, trademarks and copyright, um, I feel like those are increasing in value every day because of um, the digital the digital age we're in. Rep your reputation, um, I think, is probably one of the biggest components of having a successful business these days. You know, one thing goes wrong with your business and it's all over social media, and that can completely destroy um, all the work you put into growing growing a brand. Um, and it's even worse if it's someone else who was using your brand or your mark and they make a mistake and it affects your business. Um, so looking at that stuff up front really reduces that risk. Um, and that's something I do every day. I, um, I always like to joke that most people would love to go their entire life without ever having to meet an attorney. Because you always need an attorney when something is gone horribly wrong, right? So you've been in a car accident, you're getting a divorce, someone's died, you've been arrested. Um, I, I also like to joke that that is why attorneys are called counselors, um, because it's really just something horrible has happened for the most part. I feel like I'm on the opposite end with my job. People are really excited about a new business, a new product, um, their brand, their marketing, and they're coming to us to, to protect that. Um, so I would just say have those conversations on the front end um, and really make sure you're putting yourself in the right path to protect it going forward. Um, I guess to sum it all up, the entrepreneur's toolbox, if there's one theme of our presentation today, it's um, know who to ask, have people to talk to, whether it's an attorney, an accountant, a mentor, a team member, surround yourself with people who can support you because no person can build their dream alone. And if you surround yourself with the right people, then they can help make your dream really take off. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. How do we make an appointment? <laughs> sure, yeah. So I actually have some cards on me. Um, I can get a card. I'm actually also down on the first floor of the tech park every Tuesday, Thursday, uh, right next to Brent's office. Um, and then our main office is just a couple blocks away in the Bank of America building. Um, yeah, you can shoot us an email or a phone call, maybe it's a time to chat. Um, I'm always happy to have people just drop by the office on Tuesday, Thursday as well. Um, breaks up the, the monotony a little bit, so, um, yeah. So can you, uh, in layman's terms, help us understand when we should engage with you about trademark versus copyright and when that's important? Like, sure. Is it, like, yeah. I'll give you a brief overview today, but I will put in a plug. I'm speaking again at the Venture Center um, in late October on actual legal issues and kind of getting down in the nitty gritty about these different topics. Um, but so trademark, copyright, patent is a very generally patent would cover your invention. So a product, um, a, a process of doing something. Trademarks cover your brand identifiers. So logos, your name, slogans. When people see that, they think of your business. That's what a trademark covers. Copyrights cover kind of your creative works. Um, generally thought to cover, you know, books or movies, um, anything that's kind of artistic. Um, just a little uh, kind of caveat that in the tech world, you can actually use copyright to protect your software as well, um, the, the code of your software. So uh, that's kind of a, a very broad overview of those three and kind of the path they go. So, you know, trademarking, I would say every business should consider at least getting some protection on their mark. Um, it's the really the only way to protect your reputation within um, the kind of space you're in. If you don't protect your mark, then someone else can go out and start using one similar, um, you know, you're opening yourself up to risk there. Copyrights are important. Um, I would, I, they're, the reward of a copyright is very beneficial because it's very inexpensive to get. So for, for code and stuff like that, um, the cost of getting a copyright 
is so, so less uh, than a patent or a trademark that I would always recommend it just because it does give you that protection on your works. Um, but yeah, if you want to know more about that, um, I'll be speaking late October.